chapter 8. Uh, we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 15. I'm not going to read those. Again, uh, I've been doing this, I guess, a lot lately, not planning on it, but uh, again, we welcome all of you here and uh, those of you that listen and watch from foreign places, many of you studying for the ministry. Th thank you for being part of our Wednesday night class. And um, this is what, again, for those who are studying for the ministry, a number of different kinds of sermons you can preach. This is, again, a an expository sermon, most people would call it, or teaching because we're looking not at one verse or one subject only, but a, a, a one portion of scripture, more than one verse. I don't want to just read them because we're going to be teaching our way through. Uh, if you don't have a bulletin, the subject tonight is custom tailoring. Custom tailoring. Luke's Gospel, chapter 8, verses 5 through 15. And you'll probably have noticed as we go along through this, that there's a parallel account of the same parable in Matthew's gospel. So we'll probably mention a couple of things about that too. But the, the subject matter is custom tailoring. Why, why that, Pastor? Why, are you, why would you do a teaching on custom tailoring? We didn't come here for a new suit. Well, what we want to do is apply a, a spiritual aspect to that concept. I remember uh, many years ago now, Solomon and I were downtown and forget what, where we were on our way to, but we walked past a particular store that said custom tailoring. And he said, oh, look at that, Dad. He said, that'd be like on television, you know, where you get a custom made suit. In other words, it's not off the rack. You don't get it for a buck two ninety eight. This is, you know, specialty. And it's really specially fitted to you. It suits you. And really, that's what we're on about tonight. The Lord kind of reminded me that not everyone comes to him the same way as we're going to see. And so just as you can, if you invest the time and the money and the effort, you can have a custom tailored suit that, that is for you and only you. In the same way, you and I can present the gospel, the good news, in a way that's custom tailored to each person that we cross paths with. And as I say, as we'll see, not everybody receives the gospel the same way. Maybe you've never thought about this, but I think it's very helpful. So we're going to be looking tonight at the sower. We're going to be looking at the seed. We're going to be looking at the soil. And then hopefully coming in for a landing on how it all ties together. Uh, we're starting, of course, with the parable. And this is something that Jesus, of course, is known for. Nearly every public speaker that gains the, the interest of the crowd will use stories. I've had people tell me about an illustration in a, in a sermon, and they don't remember the sermon, but they remember the story. When did that happen again? Who was that again? And that's just because we remember about 80% of what we see, but only about 20% of what we hear. So in other words, if I say, now this afternoon, I was praying for tonight's service, and unfortunately, I didn't have my cat, Boston Blackie, with me to help me pray. When I say that, what do you see? You immediately see a black cat, right? Either laying on the bed beside me or on my lap if I'm on a chair or recliner. Uh, that's just the way we're wired. And that's why Jesus used so many of these parables, these stories, because as he paints the picture with words, they come alive. Not only that, but they stay with the person after he's moved on to another place. And so that's what we're thinking about tonight, a parable, a story that enables us to see things we couldn't have seen any other way. Here it is. Again, this is my paraphrase of Luke 8, 5 and following. Jesus speaking, the sower went out to sow his seed. And as he, he sows some of which fell beside the road and was trampled upon and the Birds of the heaven devoured it. Really, really rich with truth. Just this first sentence. The sower translates spiron from the word sporon, and we get our English word spores, you know, spores that go out and they, they become things and so on. So this is what we're talking about, a seed. It's used of seed time. It's used of sowing the seed. It's used of the seed itself. And this is what Jesus is, is using as the illustration for what he's on about tonight. And I think it's so powerful. I want to make a couple of points here as we kind of just begin. 
it doesn't just say a sower, it says the sower, right? I've mentioned this before, the language that God gave us our New Testament in, Kini Greek, uh, is very precise. And a Greek won't use an article, the, just because he's uh, get at the end of a line and you know, he needs to fill up some space. Uh, a Greek will never use a, a definite article without a reason. So the fact that the master uses the article, the sower, it kind of gives you the idea. He's talking about a particular one. Now look at the, uh, the verse again. Luke's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 5. The sower went out to sow his seed, and as, and here again, Jesus adds an extra pronoun, and as he, he sows, such and such happened. What's so important about that, Pastor? I think he's making a point. He's not talking about any old sower. He's talking about a particular one. Well, who might that be? If you go to the parallel account in chapter uh, 13 of Matthew's gospel, you find in the wheat and tare story, who's the sower? Who sows the wheat? Jesus. Who sows the tares? Satan. And I think Jesus is on about the same thing here. Well, you say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. J Jesus doesn't witness to everybody that gets saved. Uh, yeah, he does. He does it through us. He brings the word to everyone who comes to God, but he brings it through us. So he's doing the sowing, but he's doing it through us. And I, I, I kind of like to think that this is what's going on here. The sower, the master, he, he is sowing his seed, again, the Lord Jesus, through you, through me, through anyone and everyone who will make themselves available. I mean, think about it. He said, the words I speak to you, they are spirit and are what? Life. And the words he speaks through us to other people that need to be brought into the kingdom of God bring them eternal life. Now, what's a, what about this bird business? The birds of the air devoured it. Not a pretty picture, is it? Uh, it, it? Actually, in the parallel account, Matthew 13, verse 19, it's used of Satan. Satan steals the word that's been sown in their heart. So think about it. The Lord Jesus is using us to sow his seed into the hearts of people, and Satan is using his crowd to sow false teaching into the hearts of people that are listening. Now, skip down with me, Luke 8, skip down from verse 5 to verse 12 to what Jesus is saying about this. Some hear, basically, but Satan steals the teaching, according to Jesus, lest they, not having believed, might be saved. So the idea is he's trying to interrupt the process. They're caught in Satan's grasp. The Lord Jesus, through one of his people, is bringing them news of the way out. And before they can grasp it properly, Satan snatches it out of the way, lest they believe and be saved. Let's look at the second type of soil or heart. Now, obviously, that's what we're talking about tonight, the soil of the heart. In verse 6, here's where it starts to get interesting. And other seed, other fell upon the rock. And having sprang up, it withered through it not having had moisture. Again, very interesting to me. There's an article there, not having had the moisture, as though there's a particular kind needed. So you've got soil that's, first of all, uh, devoured. I should say that the, the, the seed that's coming to the soil, devoured because Satan interrupts the process. Here in the second kind of soil, this is very, very sad in a way. It says the soil is, is rocky ground. And not only that, but it, when it comes up, it's withered because it doesn't have something required to make it grow. According to Jesus, the moisture, the, the, the additive. Now, I want to repeat this again, verse 6. Jesus said this, and other, other what? Other seed fell. 
I've mentioned this before, and it's important in a case like this. This is something you don't find in the parallel accounts. It's only in Luke's account, but it's there. Why? So you and I can benefit. Again, we're talking about custom tailoring. We're talking about getting the gospel in a, in, in a way that appeals to this person. We give it to another person in another way. Same truth, but different way of explaining it. So it's custom tailored to each person. Jesus said here, and other soil fell upon a rock. There are at least two ways of saying other in the language of the New Testament. And anyone in the, within the sound of Jesus' voice would know exactly what he's talking about here. One way to say another is another of the same kind. Another seed, in this case, another seed of the same kind. How many remember Jesus said, I'm going to send you another comforter? And who is that? The Holy Spirit. He used the word alos, another comforter just like me. I don't know what, whether you've ever wondered or not, but have you ever wondered who's in charge of the church since Jesus left? Who, who's in charge? Thank you. A lot of people don't know that. Our Catholic friends say the Pope's in charge, right? Our Orthodox friends say the patriarchs are in charge. If you go to the King of England, he'll tell you who's in charge of the church there. He is, right? Well, who's in charge of the church? According to Jesus, none of those folks. The Holy Spirit is. I'll send you another comforter, Alos, just like me. That's not what he says here. Other seed fell, and he doesn't say Alos or Alon. He says Eteron. We get the word heterosexual from that word. Someone of the opposite, different sex. I think this is absolutely stunning. In other words, it's the same gospel, but when it's sown, it's sown differently depending on the kind of soil it's going to. It's not a one-size-fits-all. Isn't that encouraging? You think about someone you've been witnessing to or a family member or an in-law or an outlaw. You're trying to get them into the kingdom of God, and it seems like it's impossible. Could it be? They need the message, yes, but they need it custom-tailored. In other words, the way you've been saying it doesn't fit. It's like a, a suit. The, the, the sleeves are too long or the pants are too short or it's, it's too tight or the belt's wrong, whatever. That, this is what's going on. And Jesus is basically saying, you know what? I care enough about my people. I care enough about the elect to get them back into the fold. I care enough about my lost sheep that I'm going to custom tailor the way they hear the word in a way that will attract them and they'll get it. So this different kind of seed fell upon the rock, having sprung up, it withered through it not having the moisture. Again, so important. Why? Not everybody comes to the Lord the same. How many of you can testify you know people that have come to Christ, not because they heard that he was the Savior of the world, but they were sick, afflicted, maybe dying, and he healed them. And after they're healed, they say, how can I know this Jesus that healed me when no one and nothing else could? And then you explain the gospel. Some people come to Jesus because they've been delivered by him from dark forces, from evil spirits. And once the evil spirit comes out, tell me more about this Jesus. I mentioned to you, I think just a little while ago, years ago now, uh, when I was in Greece preaching, there were some people from Iraq, some Iraqi soldiers that came. I still to this day don't know why they would visit a Christian meeting, but they did. And when they saw their friends getting healed supernaturally, instantly, they suddenly wanted to know not just about Jesus, the healer, who was healing when Allah wouldn't or didn't. They didn't want to just know about Jesus the healer. They wanted to know about Jesus the Savior. And the healing brought them salvation. How many are tracking with me? It was custom tailored. They needed, to, they needed to be healed in order to find God. So Jesus said, I can do that. What's the moisture mean? Why the moisture? I don't know. I don't know what that moisture means, but I, I can tell you what I think. 
See, I don't, I, I, don't, I don't say that unless I mean it. I would never like to give my opinion unless I tell somebody, this is my opinion. I'm not saying it's necessarily God's word. But as I thought about this and prayed about it, I have an idea of what the moisture might be that the second kind of soil doesn't have and causes it to be choked and withered. In Hebrews 4.2, Paul says this about Old Testament Israel, particularly the crowd that did not make it into the promised land but perished in the wilderness. Anybody remember why? Thanks, Mark. Unbelief, right? This is what Paul says in Hebrews 2. But the word of the report did not profit those. And I mean, it's just like Paul's pointing his finger. Echinus, a particular group of people, you backslidden, doubting buzzards, that just will not believe God's word when he gives it to you. The word of the report did not profit those, why, Paul, not having been mixed with, not just faith, the faith in the ones having heard. How many see that? It's just like some of these restaurants talk about their special sauce on the sandwich or whatever it is. This is God's special seasoning. It's called faith. And we have to mix our faith, trust, confidence, belief with the word of the Lord in order for something to happen. There's a verse I think you might find startling, I did, that illustrates this. In Acts 13, verse 46, Paul and Barnabas have been evangelizing. And they went to the synagogue, and the non-Jewish uh, proselytes, people that were wanting to, to get closer to the Jewish God, but they weren't Jewish by background. Most of them were Greeks. They're just, they're happy as, as pigs in mud. Oh, this is the best thing we've ever heard. Salvation in Christ, plus nothing, minus nothing, just by faith. And they just absolutely uh, came, you know. And yet... Some of God's own people after the flesh, the Jewish people themselves, weren't interested. You should read the, read the verse, Acts 13, verse 46. You know what Paul said to the unbelieving Jewish folk that wanted to give him and Barnabas the left foot of fellowship? It was necessary in the nature of the case for the gospel to be preached to you first. Think about this. You first, but since you, you reject it from yourself and consider yourself unworthy of eternal life, behold, we're going to the Gentiles. How sad. Jewish people refusing, rejecting their own, after the flesh, Jewish Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Lord Jesus. They didn't mix faith with the word of the Lord in their old covenant. How many want here? Soil three. Again, other, not another of the same kind, different seed for different people, but another of a different kind. Other seed fell in the midst of the thorns, and having sprung up together, the thorns choked it. What would those thorns be? In the explanation a few verses later, Jesus said this, these were they who, having heard and moving along through life with cares and riches and pleasures of this life, are choked. Anybody know anyone like that? Again, Jesus, perfectly, wonderfully bilingual, able to speak his native Jewish Aramaic language, and thank God for us, the Greek language, almost everything he says in the Bible is in the language of the New Testament, only speaks Aramaic about six times, we have a note of, and it's always mentioned. Jesus, again, used a definite article. They're moving along with cares and riches and pleasures of the life. Which one's that, Lord? <laughs> it's not God's, is it? It's this fallen world life. Ever heard that little phrase, he who dies with the most toys wins? That's the way some people live. Their whole life is concerned about this fleeting life. And sadly, John said, what about it? It's passing away. Would you invest in something that's disappearing while, while you're on with your, 
<laughs> with your agent. <laughs> it's already disappearing. Give me more shares of that. And that's what people are doing. The world's in the process of disappearing right before our very eyes, according to the Apostle John. And yet, for some people, this is the only life they're interested in. How sad. Boy, am I glad there's another life beside this one. How about you? Three years ago, I left this life for 15 minutes, and i got to tell you, I'm glad that that's not the only life I had. Because I was gone from here, and I was immediately upstairs with my best friend. He's still dealing with me. I've been sharing it here and there. I've had three recovered memories from when I was gone. And they're all beautiful, and they're all about Jesus, and he's nothing like what I thought he was. He just, I just didn't expect him to look that way, to act that way. Never expected, uh, well, there's no way to describe the love he has. Let's move along to the, let's move along. Don't get me started. Yes, sir. Um, I, will, I will not cry tonight. I will not do it. Um, I think I'm about cried out. Just when I think I am, it happens again. <laughs> yeah, he's really something. The last time, uh, I will say this because this is the most recent one. It, I, it's been three times now. I hope I remember something else, but three times. This last one, uh, we're, we're standing uh, in a really beautiful place, and it, it looked like marble, but it wasn't marble that we know in this world. Marble pillars and this and that. And you see always, when I've seen him, he always wears the same thing, the white robe and has the, the beard, and his hair is curlier than I thought. And he's, he's much, he looks much younger than I expected, and he's, and he's much more, I don't want to say jovial, but he, he's ha very happy. And we're talking. It was like a silent conversation. It's like someone turned the, the radio up, you know. And he, he got this serious look on his face. I had, been ta I, I had been apparently telling him about all this horrible stuff that happened in my life. I'm not di too different to you. You've probably had some difficult times in your life, right? I, been I was kind of telling him this apparently. It's kind of, I guess, saying, hey, what's all this about? Why, why did all this happen? You know, this is great being here, but what about all of that? And his face just changed. And it, I say it reverently, it was almost, almost like his feelings were hurt, sort of. Uh, but he, he said, oh, I would never let anything hurt you. I would never let anything hurt you. And he hugged me. And it was like all that stuff just went... <laughs> It was gone. Not just gone, but it was as though somehow it had never happened. And I'd just been talking about it. So you'd be surprised what he can do. He's, he's not like us. Let's get to the saving soil here. Fourth type of soil. Who's the sower? Jesus, through us. He's the one that's spreading the good news through us. Jesus. The seed, different for different cases. Some people need to hear about Jesus, the healer. Others need to hear about Jesus, the marriage mender. Other people need to hear about Jesus, the deliverer from dark forces and evil spirits. Uh, you name it, people come to Christ in different ways. And that's why the way the gospel is ministered should be custom tailored. It should be suited to, no pun intended, suited to each person that God brings across our path. Now, Listen to Jesus describe this unique individual who differs from the other three when they hear God's word or seed. And other, again, another different kind of seed, and other fell upon the ground, the good one. Again, anyone listening to Jesus, when they heard him use a second article, knew exactly what he meant. He's distinguishing this soil from the other three kind. And other seed fell upon the ground, the good one, and having sprung up, produced fruit one hundredfold. All three of the other soils bring forth nothing. In modern language, these people are not born again. They are not really believers. Only one out of four. Amazing, isn't it? This ground, compared to the other three soils, is good. Those are bad. And think about this. There's no excuse for any listener to say, well, I just, I didn't understand. No, because the, the way the gospel was brought to you, 
is tailor-made for you. It's not one size fits all. God spoke to you in a way you understood. And if you rejected that, that's on you. It's not on him. Uh, one of my mentors said the number one rule of the game is God is always right. He also said when people asked him questions he couldn't answer, he said, I don't know. And he said, but God knows. He said, I wouldn't serve a God that didn't know more than me. I'm inclined to agree with him. Isn't this good news? Yes. So, as we kind of bring this into a close, how many would like to see just a, a verse or two illustrating these three or four kinds of soil? You can just look. Yeah, you can look it up yourself. Here's a Bible example of the different soil. Number one, the people who hear the word, and before anything can happen with it, Satan steals it, lest they, having heard, make him Lord. Uh, I would suggest Luke's gospel here, farther along, verse 37. Very interesting. It's the story of Jesus delivering somebody from an evil spirit. And it was so well known, the whole town woke up to smell the coffee. Who got delivered? Who did it? And the Bible says when they caught up with Jesus, after seeing the man in his right mind, and we don't know how long he was demonized, Jesus set him free. They, they, they come en masse, one big group, to see this Jewish preacher who delivered this man from evil spirits. And why were they looking for Jesus? So they could tell him to get lost. They said, get lost. We don't want you here. We don't want this. Now, who in the world would tell a thinking human being to not want Jesus? Who in God's green earth would try to convince someone that it's better to keep a devil than to be delivered of it and to serve the God that has the power to do the delivering? Only one person I can think of. As Jesus said in another place, an enemy hath done this. Here's soil number two. Here's soil number two, and how do we describe that? Um, the rock, yeah, the hard, the hard, stony soil, yeah. I would say this is illustrated in Luke's Gospel, chapter 7, the previous one to this one. Luke 7, verse 9. There, Jesus praises a pagan centurion for having faith enough to tell the master, you know what? You don't have to come to my house and lay hands on my servant or speak certain words over me. Just speak the word and my servant will be healed. I'm a man under authority and I've got people under my authority. I say, go, they go. I say, stop, they stop. And what did Jesus say? I haven't found faith like this in Israel. His own people. And once again, I'm not trying to ride a, ride a hobby horse, but I have quest, I, people quest me once in a while. Greek? Really? Jesus spoke? I never, th never thought about that. What language do you think that Roman centurion spoke? Do you think he spoke Aramaic? Not on your life. Spoke Greek? How did Jesus talk to him? Jesus was bilingual. Almost all of his public conversations and teaching are in the Greek of the New Testament. I'm so glad they are. Most of the people wouldn't have understood a word he said. But most people, many people were bilingual in the time of Christ, especially his own people. They spoke Aramaic as well as Greek. Number three, how about the, the, the soil that receives the seed, but instead of just clinging to the seed and letting the world go, it, as Jesus phrased it, it moves along with the cares and the pleasures and the riches of this life, Right? If you look in the Gospel of Luke chapter uh, 18, verse 23, you have the story of this rich, would-be disciple asking the Lord, what must I do to be saved, and this, that, and the other thing. What did he tell him? Sell what you have, give to the poor, and come follow me. And the Bible says he went away sorrowful. So it was the, that's, that's the third kind of seed. I'm interested... You know, tell me some spiritual stuff, Lord. I'm interested, but then when you get 
to the walking it out. You've, you've left preaching and gone to meddling. I think I'll, I'll pass. And he just went away sorrowful. And so uh, that would be that third kind of soil. What about the last one, the good soil? Again, the centurion, Luke's gospel, chapter 7, verses 6 through 8, where G the man says to the Lord Jesus, you don't need to do anything personally. Just say the word and it'll be done. And Jesus praised that pagan's faith above those, the, the faith of many of his own countrymen after the flesh. And then we come back to the end here. And having said these things, he, Jesus, cried. The one continually having ears to hear, let him hear at once. And here's the disciples. His disciples asked him, saying, what might be the parable? What is the story? This one. And here is what Jesus says as we come in for a landing tonight that I think is just priceless. To you, it stands given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. How many like gifts? What does gift mean? Free. Free. To you, it stands given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of, kingdom of God, but to the rest in parables, in order that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Again, if you read the parallel account in Matthew's gospel, chapter 13, verse 11, Jesus is emphatic when he says, it stands given to you to know, it has not stood given to them to know. And the picture is, the language Jesus used is, at a point of time in the past, God gave a free gift of understanding the words of the Holy Spirit, the words of the Heavenly Father, the words of the Lord Jesus. And he's not an Indian giver, as the old phrase used to be. He doesn't give and then take it back. He gives and it remains. And by the same token, those who are not truly interested in him, those who are not what the scripture calls his called or his elect or his sheep, uh, the, the wheat, the good seed, the good fish, the wise servant, the wise, the, under, the wise virgins, those who are not that, they don't get it. If they got it, they would, mis, they would misuse it. They would probably try to make a profit. Now, I know no preachers are trying to make a profit, are they? I can't imagine preachers preaching for money or big crowds. I heard about one, one joker. He wanted to know what, what gym they had signed him up. <laughs> about all you can do is just say, Lord, save him before it's too late, you know. What gym did you sign me up for now when I visit for the, the meetings? And somebody else wants a certain kind of candy on their pillow, you know. <laughs> you, you, can't, you can't make this up. Um, that's not the kind of minister Jesus was. I had heard about another, I'm not to call the name, but another world-class minister, quote, unquote, um, that had been to Greece and, and didn't do so well there. And when he went, the, the, he had to have the, the, the building curtained off so nobody could see the empty seats. He wouldn't come out on the platform until they fixed that and curtained it off because he has to have a big crowd. Yeah. It's a big world, isn't it? Big world. So, finally, why would it be then that this other group of people would not be able to understand they see, but they don't see. They hear, but they don't hear. And if you read Matthew's account, it's much stronger. He actually quotes the Old Testament proverb, this people's heart is waxed, grow, waxed hard, and they don't see and they don't hear. Uh, they're just that adamantly against the truth. Why would that be? I'll give you a closing verse here, and then if anybody has questions. John 5, 43. This again, this is not me. This is the Lord speaking. This is God in the flesh. Five, John 5, 43. Speaking to his own countrymen who refused to believe in him. Why are you not knowing my speech? The Lord Jesus asks his countrymen. 
because you are unable to hear my teaching. You, you are out of your father, the devil, and his desires you choose to do. Jesus said that. So there's no middle ground. Well, I don't want to serve God, but I, you know, I don't want to serve the devil either. I just kind of want to live for myself. God didn't give us that option. You, see, you, you, you hold to one, you despise the other. You love one, you hate the other. No man can serve two masters, but we all serve one. There's no middle ground or third option. And uh, I think it's quite clear here. And I think this, this sower, seed, and soil kind of illustrates it. And again, I think what God's trying to maybe really emphasize tonight is about this seed and about this sower. Um, he comes and tailors his message, custom tailors his message, to where that person is in life. We're all raised differently. We all have different needs. We all have different backgrounds. And he knows that. And I, it just, I think it's ex extremely beautiful and loving to see that his word actually says the seed that's sown is different for each soil. So he's doing all he can, right? And it's up to us to respond uh, in, in the positive. And, of course, as we know from God's word, his elect, his chosen, his people, whatever word you want to use, uh, they will do that. And that's one reason we know who they are, uh, because they will come when they hear the word. Anybody else now have a question, input, output, or Michael? Do uh, some people who end up being Christians <clears throat> maybe get approached to dog it, and then they maybe, eh, you know, it takes yeah. you a while before they find it. Right. Good question. If you, for those listening, you can't hear. Mike's asking, why is it that some people who do receive Christ, why do they dog it sometimes? Why does it take so long for them? Very good question. And I, I think it's kind of like healing. There's no one size fits all. But I know what you're talking about. Um, I've, you probably talked to people I know I have. I've talked to people in the ministry that knew they were called to preach from a child, but they, they just kind of didn't want to do it, you know. Uh, what's back of that? Good question. I don't know that there's any one particular reason for each person, but uh, the good news is they're getting the word in a custom tailored way for them to understand. And uh, it will bring the result. So in other words, the problem's never on God's end, it's always on ours. Anybody else? Yeah, our visitor, brother. I've lived a long life. One of my problems was uh, grandiosity, pride, arrogance. You do? I, I had been saved. Wow. I had been saved. I had a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Wow. But the things of the world just kept attracting me. Yeah. And uh, I wasn't really 100% surrendered to the Lord. And but why, by the grace of God, see, I didn't do any of this. Yeah. I mean, things got bad, yeah. and it takes a lot to, to give up, to, you know, you have to just die yourself. Maybe that's kind of answering Mike's question. In your die case, you have, you have it's lost not easy. It's right. not easy, but you get to the point yeah. where nothing else makes any sense. Yeah. Whether I have a job, whether I don't, whether my wife stays or whether she right, doesn't, right. I got it. I'm surrendering to you. Right. When you do that, yeah. bam, mm. bam, maybe and that was 33 years wow. ago. I haven't been the same since. Awesome. Maybe it's the prodigal son. Maybe some people haven't suffered enough. You'll notice that when he finally hits the pig pen, it says he came to himself. It's actually he came into himself. Like the light dawns, you know, oh, what, what am I doing here in the pig pen? My old man's rich. You know, I could have my own room. And, uh, you, you, brother, you had something? Uh, evangelizing. Right. Uh, what uh, indications uh, do we look for to, to be able to uh, Distinguish brother the type of soil, the soil. Yeah, yeah. And, and the person, and then how do we customize according to yeah. those uh, four yeah. types? It's a good question. How, how do you know what kind of soil it is, and how do you know how to approach the person? And I, I think it's not, it's, I don't mean this as a cop out, I really think it's true. Um, we have to depend on the Holy Spirit. 
He will give us maybe a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge. He'll show us something about the person that we would have no natural way of knowing. Um, so I think a lot of times, it's not, again, it's not a one-size-fits-all. I'm rereading a book by one of my mentors, and, and he's talking in there quite a bit about faith comes by hearing, hearing by a word from God. And it's different for different people for different times. Um, I've had that happen in my meetings where God will show me something about somebody I have no way of knowing. And that, that very fact opens their heart to the gospel. You know, how would, how would someone from 10,000 miles away know what I'm suffering from here in Australia or whatever? Um, so I think that, that kind of thing, that's where I think you and I and all believers need to be kind of sensitive, you know, and I think we can, we can tell by sometimes their body language when someone, they'll lean in and you know you've sort of got them, they, they, they want to hear more or the opposite, <laughs> you know. Again, one of, this book I just reread by my, one of my mentors, he talked about, he had a vision one night for the service and he saw these peaches on this tree. Some were just ready to drop off. Others were green. And he said, don't, the Lord said to him, don't push it. When you preach tonight, he said, don't try to get everybody saved. Just go for the ripe peaches. And the next time you're out, some more of those green will be ripe. And he said it saved him a lot of headache because it, it wasn't dependent on, on him, you know, which it isn't. But uh, that's a beautiful thing. And, and that, you know, he, he, one time he, fa he fasted for two weeks, very unusual. He was, a very, was a, not a heavy set person at all. He it was only 120 pounds, something like that. But he fasted for two weeks, and he was waiting to see the angels and this and that, and didn't, nothing happened. He said, but at the end of the fast, he heard one thing from the Spirit of God, be led by the Spirit. That phrase stayed with him, and he said and that changed his whole ministry. Um, he, he didn't run people through the cookie cutter anymore where you get, a, get them all in line or give them a, a card with a number on it, you know, and, or you anoint them all with oil. Or, he, didn't, he, 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 just, he said, I realize kind of what my brother's asking about. Not everybody receives things the same way. And so we have to be, you know, in tune with that person. And I think it comes through experience. It comes through trial and error. But a lot of times it just comes from the spirit of God. Uh, you know, he just he will give you insight. Solomon, you had something? Yeah. With faith. Yeah. Right. They're holding back for some reason. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we have to we have to surrender. Yeah. Now I have a question. JC. Sure. Okay. Love your teaching. Uh -huh. it, 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 it resonates inside of me like I'm hearing directly. I know we're, we're human, but I'm so grateful that God Thank allowed you. me to, to come here and to keep coming. And I hope you live a long time. <laughs> don't do any more of those, those trips. As <laughs> <laughs> long as I don't make it here, work, so I just tell, tell God summons you. I know, but, yeah. but I hope you can be here. I hope I can keep coming for a long time. Yeah, me too. Love me getting too. a lot. Well, you thank you for the kind words, kind of you to say. Um, every, every preacher needs encouraged. But, yeah, when you look at the crowd or the lack of the crowd, you know, and then on the other hand, you look at what's happening overseas. The, I, I preached the message Sunday. I don't know, was it 20, 30, 40 people from China are downloading the message I just preached? It's strange, you know. And uh, I look today, and my book, somebody's read it in Jordan, somebody, several people in Egypt. Um, and so when you figure that you, 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 you figure that out, you say, well, it's not coming the way it, you, you thought it would. But I, I told Solomon, um, I reminded him. Yeah. Well, you know, it's kind of maybe this will help some preacher, you know, watching or listening because uh, I've been at. The, well, it, it's kind of strange, but let me just mention this before we go to, to the Lord's Supper. But I think it maybe again, maybe it'll help one of my brother or sister preachers. Um, it was right around the turn of the century. Um, I, I used to do a lot of short-term mission trips, and I'd kind of been waved off that, and I, could, I felt bad about it. And the uh, Lord gave me a dream. And in the dream, I'm, I'm sort of like downtown, and I see this heavy set fellow on the corner, and he kind of nodded at me, smiled, had a black suit on. And I thought, what's this about? So the next thing I know, I'm, I'm, I'm on that corner. 
He said, you're a preacher, right? I said, yeah. He said, you used to do a lot of traveling, didn't you? Short-term trips? I said, yeah. You've been asking yourself, are you missing God because you don't like feel to do it or want to do it like you used to? I said, yeah. He said, uh, this is a different season. That was then. This is a different season. And I woke up with the power of God all over me. And it wasn't long after that, I was praying in my office. Very clearly, I heard just a sentence, focus on the Internet. But over 20 years ago, focus on the Internet. And I thought, well, that makes a lot of sense because I know enough about the Internet to be dangerous, you know. And I thought, how in the world? But my wife's pretty sharp. You know, she, she, she got our website started before they were really popular, thankfully. So we got a really good website name and everything. And my son is just off the chart with technical stuff. You know, he doesn't think so, but I'm telling him he is. And it just goes to show you that's what happened. I used to take these short trips, you know, and you come back tired. I'm not, I don't regret it, but I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not fun. I'm not one of these big shot preachers that, you know, um, goes to the gym and all that when they get there. Um, but uh, so I thought, well, this is, this is good because I'm not missing God. It's just a different time, different phase. And all this time, all this time, it's been growing and growing and growing. And um, I hope this encourages people. Again, we come back to the same old, same old. The just shall live by faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by a word from God. When I came back from, when I came back from Australia, I was uh, in, the, in the plane, hadn't even off, gotten off the plane. And uh, I'm sitting there, and the Holy Spirit said, I'm going to use you to raise up ministry in Africa. I just came off the mission field. I thought, what? I sat there, and I started talking in tongues again, undertone, and the same came again. I'm going to use you to raise up ministry in Africa. And I forget how long it was after that. I was in Holland preaching for Brother Mosbach in his churches. And I was having lunch in the cafeteria. There were some of the other preachers. And this tall, heavyset African-American fellow comes over. Can I sit with you, brother? I said, sure. So we're sitting there talking this and that. And he said, I really liked your meeting. I really appreciate your message. I said, fine. He said, uh, would you consider coming to Africa? I said, if the Lord sends me. He said, uh, do you, you have books and stuff? I said, yeah. He said, would you be willing to send some to us? And I said, yeah. And I don't know how many hundreds of courses and books. That's how my ministry outreach to Africa started. I, I got the word in Cincinnati after I came back from overseas, and I got the connection in Holland. You can't make this stuff up. This is crazy. And then fast forward, and I'll be, I'll be doing this now for 50 years this fall, and uh, I, my, my language, my statement is, as long as I don't make it worse. You know, I appreciate kind words, but that's all I'm concerned about. But I don't mess it up. So uh, I don't think I need to say this, but I should, I guess, once in a while. Because every church is different. We, you don't have to be a member here to receive the Lord's Supper. We don't believe that way. Paul said, examine yourself and then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So it's not up for us to decide who's worthy, who isn't, or who's right or wrong. So you're welcome to receive the Lord's Supper with us tonight. I will say we are very, um, uh, how would you say, very committed to the concept of, some people call it real presence or sacramental union, meaning it's not just symbolic for us. We kind of follow the Lutheran view there that uh, we pray over the emblems and, and thank the Lord. They're distributed, they're received, and then as the words of institution are spoken, we believe that the, the body and blood of Christ are in, with, and under the bread and cup so that they're both there at the same time. It doesn't change into the other. They're both there at the same time and only during the supper. So I think it's God's view. My little book, The, the Lord's Supper, explains that. We're going to come around the Lord's Supper. Um, if you have gifts tonight, that's great. Basket's here, one of the foyer.